Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our fifth tea talk for the season. As you know, most of you know, I'm Jerry Ann Bogus, the executive director for the Black Heritage Trail. And we're so delighted to be sharing this um, series with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, today's program will definitely um, be looking at, Dan, do you have the slide for the next slide? All right, before we, um, before we start, I just wanted to um, acknowledge that we are on traditional lands and waterways of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki people, past and present. And we, um, we, we honor their, their presence and we just are delighted and to be able to share the space and acknowledge their, their uh, stance that we have followed. Uh, next one, please, Dan. For those of you who know, the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire promotes awareness and appreciation of African-American history and life in order to build more inclusive communities today. We create, we do this through creating programs like the Tea Talk, where we create a safe space for people to have conversations on topics um, dealing with history, but how they are, how the history has led us to where we are now and how we can do better um, as we build our future. Next slide, Dan. Um, the series that you're, you've been attending, this is the fifth one, um, the title Claiming Our Place, Blacks in White Spaces, is really looking at spaces where Blacks and people of color are marginalized, typically absent and unexpected. Our first um, talk looked at um, the land um, in public spaces, farmland. We looked at uh, science fiction, where we are in literature. We've looked at um, the civil rights movement here in New Hampshire, and we've, all, we've also explored the region of the soul um, through our last talk. Um, today's talk, today's conversation, The Power of Place, Martha's Vineyard, and the Growth of the Black Elite. Um, we will look at uh, movement and development uh, through travel of uh, uh, Black communities and um, some of the complexities of what it means to be a, um, we'll look at some of the complexities around race and class in, the, in our country. Um, we do this, the tea talks, um, just like sharing conversations around over a cup of tea. We're asking all of you to participate with us. Um, Gina will come along and give you some um, tips on how to use the Zoom format that we're in. Um, but it really is, we want to really create a space for dialogue and to share your own ideas. Our presenters will talk for a brief minute, but mostly we'll be, caught, we'll be in a conversation. Um, next slide, Dan. Oops, not that one. Can I have the other one, the books? Also, um, we're happy to have with us um, Gretchen Soren, and these are just some suggested readings that will help with the conversation if you're interested after. Um, they are on our website along with some um, additional reading. And I'm going to pass you on over to Gina now um, for her to just um, do some housekeeping. Marianne. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I just a couple of quick housekeeping things. Uh, if you would please keep your mics muted during the presentation portion of the event today. Uh, we would appreciate that. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, the, our moderator and myself will be keeping an eye on that to, um, to get your questions across. Um, if you have any problems with your technical 
side of things, if you're not hearing anything or seeing anything, we can um, please preface your question with the words IT, with the letters IT, and that way our team will know that you're having some IT problems and someone will reach out to you and try to give you a hand with that. Um, if, you know, for, that, for best viewing, if you could please put your Zoom in presenter mode. If you go up to the top right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see the little word view that gives you a drop-down menu and you'll see um, an option for side-by-side -side speaker. Um, if you check that or select that option, um, that's the best viewing mode for this presentation this evening. Um, and finally, I'm going to run through the community dialogue group agreement real quick that you see on your screen in front of you. We ask you to please be respectful. Please listen and share airtime. Please focus on the idea, not the person. Please be present and be crisp and say what is at the core of the discussion. Please be open-minded and honor the confidentiality amongst all participants. It's okay to put issues like race and class on the table and please take risks, be raggedy, make some mistakes and then let it go. And uh, Jerrianne, back to you. Okay, thank you, Gina. Um, so it's with much about do, we'll just get started. Um, I will introduce our moderator, Bethia Carter, who is the president and CEO of New England Blacks in Philanthropy out of Boston, Massachusetts. She was formerly the executive director of Grand Circles Foundation, senior director of the Division of Community Impact at United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley, and program director of the Girls of Greater Boston. Carter has also served as a consultant in the philanthropic sector, focusing on the needs of children and families in the greater Boston and surrounding areas. Before entering the nonprofit sector, she worked for nearly 10 years in the financial service industry in New York and Boston. In addition, she served on the boards of several local and national nonprofit organizations. Carter has published several articles, including Examining the Value of Black America in Memor in memoriam and pledging allegiance. I'm gonna happy and delighted to pass it over to Bathaya to lead us in the conversation um, for today's program. Bathaya. Thank you, Jerry Ann. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here today. I am truly delighted to be a part of this conversation. Um, a conversation that is long, long, long overdue, a conversation that we often don't hear. You know, and what a perfect time to have both tea and conversation as we think about these two things and how they relate to Black America. Too often we don't think we see them as sometimes an oxymoron. We know that tea originated in China, but it did arrive in Africa in the 1600s. And although it wasn't fully cultivated until the 1800s until in Malawi, it is one of the chief exports of Kenya, Malawi, and Tanzania. So I hope you have your tea ready because we are going to get ready to spill some tea as well. Um, as we talk through particularly this idea of Blacks and travel and Black upper class even, I mean, black elites. Too often it's not acknowledged or discussed, it's seen as a bit of an oxymoron, black and elite. Well, actually those two have been coming together for a very long time. From whether it was freed blacks to former slaves, they provided unique partnerships and unique ways that they came together to hold conversation, to help free not only their peers and their family, but fight against slavery, Jim Crow, black law, the black codes that tried to diminish our collective achievement and our collective movement. But we pressed on nonetheless. Our elite strategize, work together to create progress, not just for black people, but for everyone. And we did this across borders, whether what state we were in, we came together to try to find a way that we could not only press on, but press upward as well. And I'm so delighted to be a part of today's conversation with three distinguished women to share not only their stories, their history, but their knowledge with us as well. So get your pen ready right next to your 
your tea. Today we have with us, starting is Dr. Gretchen Soren. She is the Distinguished Professor and Director of Cooperstown Graduate Program at the State University of New York. Dr. Soren writes and lectures frequently on African-American history museum and museum practice. Her books include Touring Historic Harlem, Four Walks in Northern Manhattan with architectural historian Andrew Dolcart. In the spirit of Martin Luther King, she also wrote The Living Legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Through the Eyes of Others, an African-American and Identity in American Art and Case Study in Cultural Entrepreneurship, How to Create Relevant and Sustainable Institutions. Dr. Soren's new book, Driving While Black, African-American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights was recently featured in PBS documentary by Mr. Burns. Next, after she sets, creates the setting for us, we will hear from Lauren Van Allen, who is a member of the Shears family, owners of Shears Cottage, an African-American family-owned inn established almost 120 years ago. Shears Cottage, Shears Cottage listed in the Negro Motorist Green Book for decades, six generations of her family have owned homes, lands, and businesses on Martha's Vineyard since the 1800s. Her great-great-grandparents, Charles and Henrietta Scherer, first started going to the island for Baptist revivals. They worshiped at the Baptist Tabernacle in the Highlands of what was then Scherer's um, what was then Cottage City, renamed Oak Bluffs. Shear Cottage and Shear Summer Theater are part of the permanent exhibits at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., where they discuss the power of place. She is also the current donor relations director at TBF and a dear, dear friend. Joanne Dowdell, our next speaker, she has worked in Washington DC area for the Congressional Quarterly and FDA News between 1989 and 2002. She is currently the senior director, senior vice president of global government affairs at News Corp in Washington DC. And to 2003, she actually moved to Portsmouth, New Hampshire to become Vice President and Director of Corporate Responsibility for Citizens Advisor. From 2008 to 2010, she was busy as she worked as the Senior Vice President and Director of Corporate Responsibility from Centennial Investment Company in Montpelier, Vermont. In 2012, she ran for election for the U.S. House representing New Hampshire's first district. I am so delighted to be within this esteemed group today. And we will start with Dr. Soren setting the context of what we should know and understand about travel and the Black elite. And then we will follow with Ms. Van Allen and Ms. Dowdell talking about their experiences in their family. Dr. Soren. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, start by sharing my screen. Hmm. Okay, there we go. Can everybody see? Can you see the, the slides? Yes. Okay. Yes. Perfect, thank you. Yes. I, just want to, I just want to make sure. <laughs> so I started uh, on this journey um, studying African-American travel because uh, I was, a friend of mine gave me a copy of the Negro Motorist Green Book about 20 years ago, long before, long before anybody uh, had thought about a movie. And I was curious about it. And that's how I got into this story. But what dawned on me as I studied this was that it really wasn't a story about the Green Book. It was really a story about mobility. And I would like you all to think for a minute just um, how mobility has been restricted for you during this COVID crisis. And then imagine um, how African-American mobility was restricted from the very beginning. It was restricted from the beginning that African people set foot on the shores of the United States. And mobility is essential to freedom. Mobility is a core 
value of freedom. And yet for African-Americans, that mobility was denied. Um, African-Americans traveling in the United States or in the colonies um, had to have passes. And those passes could be made out of paper. And sometimes they were metal tags that they had to wear. But it was what gave you permission to be off of the plantation or the farm where you lived. If you were a free Black, you had to carry your freedom papers with you at all times. So you always had to be armed with some identification that proved you were a free person or that proved you had permission to be off of the plantation or the farm of your, of your owner. So again, we're talking about mobility being restricted and denied. Think about the fact that the earliest police departments in the United States were composed of the citizens of the community who gathered to become slave catchers and slave watchers. Um, and so here you see an example of the slave patrols that patrolled cities, both North and South, looking for escaped or runaway slaves, or who were making sure that Black people did not gather at night. Um, and these were the very earliest police departments. You start to see here um, how the relationship between African Americans and the police um, has, was forged. And of course, uh, thinking about public transportation versus uh, private transportation. We are a nation of drivers. We became a nation of drivers in the 20th century, um, largely because African-Americans did not want to take um, public transportation. Public transportation was segregated. It was humiliating. It was filthy. African-Americans on trains were relegated to the back as they were on buses. The, the train cars were rarely cleaned. Um, it was, the bus drivers were, were frequently armed and rude. And so for African-Americans, travel by automobile became the way to travel. By the 1950s, African-American families were purchasing cars in very large numbers. They wanted their children to be educated. They wanted their children to see the country just as white families did. And so by the 1950s, as we're starting to build highways across the United States, African -American, uh, the African-American middle class is becoming consumers and they're becoming consumers of automobiles and of travel and of hotels and motels and restaurants, just as they were becoming consumers of percolators and television sets and refrigerators. And I think it's important um, to remember that the growing black middle class is becoming, um, they're becoming consumers of all kinds of products and they are using their purchasing power to make decisions about which companies they will support and which companies they won't support. And very often those decisions are based on companies that are showing racism or not. So as African-Americans are becoming uh, as it's becoming really important for African-Americans to acquire um, automobiles. There are many African-Americans who cannot buy cars, uh, buy houses, and they can't buy houses because their neighborhoods are redlined. Black neighborhoods across the country are redlined and it's much more difficult for black families to purchase property and to purchase buildings, homes um, with this redlining. And, they can't get mortgages from banks. So when you can't get a mortgage from a bank to buy a house, you have more money to spend and put into an automobile, which is a family's second largest purchase. And so African-Americans are buying, not only are they buying lots of automobiles, but they're buying big automobiles. And they're buying them big and heavy because they don't know where they're going to be welcome when they go out on the road. So they'll have to carry blankets and pillows with them in their car. They don't know if they can stop at a hotel. So they'll need those blankets and pillows. They don't necessarily know if they can stop at a gas station. So often African-American families carried a gallon or two of gasoline in their cars. They always carry a cooler full of food and drink because they don't know if they can stop at a, at a, um, at a restaurant and eat. 
So your, your automobile becomes like a, a rolling uh, house on wheels because you are carrying all of these materials in it that you need to protect your family and to feed your family and to provide a place for your family to sleep in the event that you can't find the services that white people can find as they travel along the road. And African-Americans are traveling from safe black space to safe black space. So you're going from your community, wherever that may be in the nation, and you're going to black resorts, you're going to black beaches, you're going to black hotels, but in between safe black space and safe black space, you have to cross into white space. And that's what made travel very dangerous for African-Americans. Um, here's a, a snapshot of a family that stopped by the side of the road and just enjoying some refreshments and they've got their trunk open and you can see that they're carrying um, their food with them in the car. <clears throat> so African-Americans, the decisions that they made about which cars to buy were based on safety, based on race and based on all of the things that they had to carry. Um, and I, I just love this photograph. This is a 1930 Cadillac um, and it's shown on a street in Harlem with a couple wearing their very fashionable raccoon coats. Um, the most popular automobile for African-Americans was the Buick. A Buick was a high-end car and it was perceived as being very safe. It was a very heavy car and hard to turn over. So if you happen to encounter an angry white mob, um, which did happen to some families, um, it would be hard for them to turn that car over. Um, but the Buick also had a very large trunk and the trunk, as I said, could carry all of that gear that you needed to bring with you. It's interesting to note that African-Americans often bought Fords as well. And black people would buy Fords because Ford hired African-Americans to work in the, in the automobile manufacturing plants in Detroit. And that was one um, avenue into the black middle class was working in the automobile factory. Um, they were paying men $5 a day, which was a good salary in that time period. Interestingly, American Jews do not buy Fords because, because Ford was a raging anti-Semite. And so you can see how identity and, and automobile ownership are tied together. So imagine what it was like for African-Americans going out on the road in their Buick or in their um, Cadillac. And here you can see, <coughs> excuse me, that the, the roadside itself was fraught with danger and with humiliating and frightening signs. And here you can see a, a welcome to Klan country sign at the entrance to North Carolina, which is where my family went every summer to visit my grandmother, there was a welcome to the welcome to Klan country sign. This is the banner over the street in Greenville, Texas, the blackest land, the whitest people, welcome to Greenville. Now Greenville is a, is a community that had a terrible reputation. They had had a couple of lynchings in Greenville. And so um, this was a, a terrifying sign when, when African-American people drove onto the main street of Greenville, Texas. And of course, throughout the United States, particularly in the Midwest, there were sundown towns. So if you were driving through um, on your way to vacation, you might encounter a sundown town. And sundown towns often had these horrible signs at, at each entrance of the town to let you know that black people were not welcome after the sunset, you could work in the town. Um, you, could, you could be a painter or a maid or a chauffeur in, in these sundown towns, but you better be out of town um, before the sun sets. And Thurgood Marshall in his autobiography recounts a story of standing on a plane of a, a train track platform waiting for a train. And a man comes up to him and says, nigger boy, what are you doing here? And he says, I'm just waiting for a train to Shreveport. And he says, well, you better be on that train because the sun has never set with a nigger in this town. So Victor Green, the person who designs and comes up with the idea for the Negro Motorist Green Book, 
believed that travel was fatal to prejudice. He believed that if African-Americans could just travel and encounter white Americans, if they could see white, uh, if white Americans could see black Americans, they would realize that we were just like them, that we had the same values, that we had the same goals. Um, and that was his mantra. This mantra, travel is fatal to prejudice, comes from Mark Twain. Mark Twain in The Innocence Abroad says travel is fatal to prejudice. So Victor Green is a, a businessman in New York. He worked for the post office um, and he had a very bad travel experience, he and his wife. And he comes home after this bad travel experience and he designs the Negro Motorist Green Book. Now the Green Book, which we've all heard of, is only one of dozens and dozens of travel guides designed for African-Americans that existed in this period from the 30s to the 1960s. The Green Book is the most long lasting and it's the most long lasting because Victor Green makes a, makes a deal with Standard Oil, which was Esso Gasoline, now Exxon Mobil, um, and they support him. They give out the Green Book, they buy thousands of copies and they give it out at their gas stations. And this is Victor and Alma Green. And I, I do have to mention that Victor gets very sick in the late 50s and Alma runs the business. And it was unheard of to have a woman owned publishing company, but here Alma Green and four other women were the, were the sole workers in this publishing company in Harlem in uh, the late 1950s and into the 1960s. And of course, you're all familiar with Rock Rest. Well, in the Green Book, there are a variety of types of places to stay, tourist houses and guest, guest homes like Rock Rest that you're all familiar with. Um, and there's Rock Rest um, and uh, an image of these very middle-class ladies having a, a nice luncheon at Rock Rest. I love their hats. I think the hats are, are wonderful. Um, but there were also motels along the highway. So you could just jump off the highway, pull your car right up to the door of a motel um, and you would be able to get right back on the highway in the morning. Um, one of the things <clears throat> that I really disliked about the Green Book movie was that all of the places that they showed African-Americans staying were dumps. They were absolutely horrible looking places because that fed the story, but that's not the way it was. And there were black luxury hotels all over the United States as there were black resorts. So Oak Bluffs is one of those black resorts, but there was American Beach in Florida. There was um, Val Verde in California. There was um, obviously um, Martha's Vineyard, but there were, there were other resorts for African-Americans and there were luxury hotels like this Hotel Teresa, which is in Harlem in New York. It's still standing. It's no longer a hotel, it's office building but um, it, it's, it's still there, you can, you can see it. Um, and these lunch, this is the place that Castro stayed when he came to travel, uh, when he traveled to the United States in the 1960s. Um, I think it would be, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, explain how the civil rights movement was totally dependent on the automobile. If you think about registering voters and you think about the number of people in the North that went South to register voters, to bring health care to poor communities that went out and taught people how to pass the, uh, the, the, the tests that you had to take in order to vote. Um, you needed a car to cover that territory. You needed a vehicle in order to cover the territory of an entire county or an entire state. This is the Jenkins microbus. It's at the Smithsonian now. This is one of those vehicles that was used to register voters. And of course, the Montgomery bus boycott, you can see Martin Luther King here on the right, ushering these women into an automobile. They wanted to uh, desegregate the bus lines in Montgomery. And the only way to desegregate the bus was for people not to take the bus. But if they, did, if they didn't take the buses, they couldn't get to work. And so Martin Luther King and the organizers of the Montgomery bus boycott purchased a fleet of automobiles and they used those automobiles to drive people to work. It's the only way to desegregate those buses. Um, 
but I want to bring you full circle now. And I would like you to think just briefly about Philando Castile, who was stopped by the police about 25 times before he was shot and murdered by the police. And of course, um, last May, George Floyd was murdered. He was pulled out of his car um, and, his, and a police officer kneeled on his neck for eight minutes until he died. So we're still in a, in a, in a state of uh, racism in this country, a state where African-Americans have to be afraid when they go out on the road, when they get in their automobiles. Um, this is a cartoon that was in a, a paper, newspaper in Minneapolis. Um, and I use it to talk about the talk. Um, and the talk, as many of you know, is the, the conversation that African-American parents um, of all social classes have with their children when they are uh, old enough to drive. Um, and it's, the talk is about how to behave when you're stopped by the police. So I will leave that as my introduction to African-American travel. And um, when the other speakers have finished, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Soren. Thank you so much for setting that context, but also helping us understand a little bit more history about ourselves and the, and the space that we sit in today. Next, we will hear from Ms. Van Allen, Lauren Van Allen, Allen to talk about one of these safe spaces, one of my favorite places, Martha's Vineyard. Lauren? Okay, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. And thank you to Jerry Ann and Bithia for inviting me to be a part of this webinar. Uh, my part of the presentation is gonna focus on my family, the Shira family who founded Shira Cottage on Martha's Vineyard. And our story is just one example of many African-Americans who have contributed to this community on, on the island. And before I start, I just wanna shout out to a few people who are in the audience. My mother, Lee Van Allen, who's the innkeeper of Share Cottage. My sister, Karma Van Allen, and Elaine Weintraub. And Elaine is the co-founder and tireless champion of the African-American Heritage Trail in Martha's Vineyard. So just wanna acknowledge those guys for being here. Um, so for me personally, Power of Place is the perfect title for this webinar because the island has definitely had an extremely powerful place in my life. Um, I owe my existence to the island and to Share Cottage because my great grandparents, my grandparents, and my parents all met on the island. Um, so as was mentioned in the introduction, six generations of the family have been on the island since the late 1800s. And Share Cottage, our inn, was founded in 1912. And it's uh, widely recognized as one of the first African-American owned inns in the country. And um, we are part of a permanent exhibit in the Smithsonian's National Museum and in the Martha's Vineyard Museum. So my great-great-grandparents, Charles and Henry Etashera, were born in Virginia, both of them, um, before the Emancipation Proclamation. Charles was born enslaved um, on a farm in uh, Spanish Oaks. And Henrietta was born a free woman of color in Lynchburg. And they met after the Civil War while they were both attending Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute, which is now Hampton University. Um, and around 1890, uh, Charles and Henrietta, my great-great-grandparents, moved from Virginia to Everett, Massachusetts, which is just north of Boston. And Charles established a successful career in the hospitality industry, where he worked at two of Boston's iconic hotels, the Young's Hotel and the Parker House. Um, so as was mentioned in the introduction, the Sheras often visited Martha's Vineyard during the summer to attend Baptist revivals. And they grew to really love the island. They de developed some um, connections with the indigenous Wampanoag community. Um, Henrietta was part Native American, so there was a natural connection there for her. Um, and over time, they grew to love the island quite a bit and they decided to purchase a home there. So they purchased their first island home in 1895. And then a few years later, they purchased another tract of land in 1903 in an area of the Highlands of Oak Bluffs that overlooks the Baptist Temple Park where the revivals were held. And they built another home there. 
Um, and every year they would close their home in Everett in mid-June and travel to the vineyard and stay there until the middle of September. And they would do this every year. And to help support the family summers on the island, they opened a business. Um, and it was a laundry business that catered to the wealthy residents that lived in Egertown and other parts of the island. Um, and they built next to their home, a one story open structure of, out of which the laundry operated and they hired island women to work for them. Um, so their entrepreneurial spirit, along with Charles's um, career in the hospitality industry, led them to decide um, to open an inn, um, which they actually did. Share Cottage was open in 1912. They converted the house into an inn. Um, and there were very limited vacation options, as, as Gretchen, Dr. Soren mentioned for African-Americans. If you had the means and the income and the leisure time to travel, there weren't a lot of options. Um, and Oak Bluffs was perfect in a way because where Sherrod Cottage is situated, it's kind of isolated, it's in the woods, it's quiet. Um, and you could be there free from Jim Crow and, and free from discrimination at a black owned location. Um, and then in 1917, my great great grandmother Henrietta passed away prematurely and the family closed the laundry business and decided to expand the inn. So they turned the, the um, laundry structure on the side of their home into more rooms and made the inn larger. Um, and in the following decades, the inn thrived. Um, the growing ranks of the black middle class were drawn to a black owned destination where they could meet and be around other people like themselves. It was a pro in a private wooded area and on any given day, folks could be observed socializing, having small concerts and plays, and enjoying delicious meals cooked by the Shara family. In fact, um, Shara Cottage was so busy that oftentimes um, neighboring black owned homes were called upon to provide extra room for overflow guests. Um, and many of our guests um, like Adam Clayton Powell Jr eventually opened, um, eventually bought their own homes on the island, which contributed to the growth of the community. Um, and in fact, we hosted many well-known African-Americans, some not so well-known, but um, there were religious leaders, politicians, professionals, entrepreneurs, and entertainers. Um, as I just mentioned, Adam Clayton Powell, the congressman um, was a guest as a young man at Shore Cottage. He often came with his father, Adam Clayton Powell Sr who is pastor of Harlem's famed Abyssinian Baptist Church. Um, other people who came and stayed at Shara are Ethel Waters, Paul Robeson, religious leader Daddy Grace, uh, Harry T. Burley, who is an arranger and a composer, stayed at Shara Cottage for many, many years. And he is widely credited with preserving the oral tradition of Negro spirituals um, by writing down the lyrics and notating the music. Um, other folks who stayed at the inn were Madam C.J. Walker, whom I'm sure many of you know, the first self-made millionaire of any race, female in the country. Um, in the 70s, Lionel Richie and the Commodores spent many summers at Shara Cottage. My cousin, Benny Ashburn, who is a third generation Shara, brought them to the island and they developed their act really in Oak Bluffs. Um, so over the decades, Shara contributed to the social economic and cultural growth of the African-American community on the island. We provided employment to black youth who were there in the summer. We, um, my great aunt Liz founded a theater company, Share Summer Theater, where she would stage the, the, uh, productions and hire, or not really hire, because it was volunteer, but have local talent um, act in these plays. Liz was also uh, a charter member of Cottages Inc., which is a philanthropic organization of African-American women who own homes on the island. Um, and Shara hosted fundraisers that were held by the Cottagers and by the Martha's Vineyard NAACP. And um, there were fundraisers, there were educational events and social events always happening at Shara. Um, and in 1898, Shara Cottage was dedicated as the very first landmark on the African-American Heritage Trail of Martha's Vineyard. And in 2012, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the inn, which is still owned and operated by descendants of Charles and Henrietta Sherrod today. Um, 
And right now we made the difficult decision to close during the pandemic, but we are in the process of embarking on a major renovation and we plan to reopen the end in 2022. Um, and I think it's important to note that as Dr. Soren mentioned, there have been other enclaves of African-Americans around the United States during the Jim Crow era. Um, but one of the things that I think makes Martha's Vineyard really unique is that this community is visible, whereas a lot of those communities were invisible. It's very visible now in the last 10 years or 20 years or so, and it still exists and it's growing and thriving. Um, and now what I'd like to do is share my screen and share some family photos from over the decades, if I can. Um, can you see this screen? Not yet, um, not yet, but if you go to share screen. Okay, give me a moment. Um, I will do that. And also in the chat room, there's a link to Shears Cottage as well. Okay. There we are. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, I can see it. Great. Okay. Let me play from the beginning. So here we are. And this um, first photograph, this was taken in 1904, and that's at Share Cottage. There's a horse and buggy there. That horse and buggy was used to um, originally to pick up and deliver laundry to the clients who were all over the island. And later it transported our guests from the ferry to the inn. Um, and these photos are from 1918. And this is on the porch at Shera Cottage. And um, my great great grandfather, Charles Shera is here. Harry T. Burley is here and here. Um, so there are family members and guests in that photo. Um, the next photo is folks on the beach. This is in Oak Bluffs. And this is around 1920. We dated this picture because my grandmother is here and she's about five years old and she was born in 1915. So we think this is about 1920 and Harry T. Burley is in these photos as well. Um, the next photo, this is in the 30s. This is again Shara on the porch. Adam Clayton Powell is in this photo. He's in the far left. A uh, tall gentleman standing there. My great great grandfather Charles Shara is third from the right. And there, and Harry T. Burley's in there somewhere as well. He was always at Shara Cottage. Um, my next slide this is the program from a production of my Aunt Liz White. She was in the theater and in the movie industry. And she ran Shara Summer Theater. She also um, had a film adaptation of, of Shakespeare's Othello, which she filmed on Martha's Vineyard. And Yafet Kodo, who you may recall from Homicide Life on the Streets, which was a series on TV in the 80s. He was her Othello. And on the right is um, one of her projections from Shara Summer Theater. That's about 1950, roughly. Um, and next is a photo from 1972 at my cousin Joanne's wedding. On the left is our family members. And on the right, you can see the Commodores and there's Lionel Richie right in the front, literally serenading my cousin from four feet away. My older brother, Dave is right in the front in this, uh, in his Nantucket reds and his blue jacket. And he, uh, he's right up front as though he's the one who's getting married. Um, so that's from, 1972. This photo was taken around 1980 and there's Liz White on the far um, right, excuse me, far left, my aunt Liz, my grandmother's in the middle and their first cousin Miriam Walker is on the left. Um, and this photo was taken from Shara Cottage's 100th anniversary in 2012. There are four generations of the Shara family in this photo. And I wanna point out the sign, Shara Cottage at the bottom, after this celebration, we actually donated this to the Smithsonian's National Museum and it hangs right now. If you've been there, you may have seen it. If you go, look for it. Um, but it's part of the permanent exhibit on Shara Cottage and Martha's Vineyard um, as we talk today. And this is Shara Cottage today. And lastly, I put together some resources which I'm happy to share with Jerry Ann and if you're interested. Um, 
you can collect them there. And please feel free to put questions in the chat and I'll try to get to them during Q&A. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you for making the vineyard real for us and sharing that history with us. Um, next, we're going to go to Joanne Daldell um, to chat with us um, further around travel and Black travel here in the, U in the U.S. Thank you so much. And Gary Ann, thank you very much for inviting me to join this panel with Gretchen and Lauren. Each year you pour your heart and soul into the programs for the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire. Your team is small but mighty and they do a great job. I'd also like to thank all of you who are here today for supporting such a worthy organization. I've been asked to kind of give an oral history of my remembrances and experiences of summering on Martha's Vineyard. I've seen um, quite a bit of change. I've had the pleasure of going to Martha's Vineyard each summer for about four decades now. And for most of those years, I planned my trip at the same time that my dad would go. And when I lived in Portsmouth, I would drive to upstate New York, scoop him up, and we would go to Martha's Vineyard together. His first cousins, Ozella and Luther Dowdell, lived in Hartford, Connecticut, and they purchased their home in Oak Bluffs on Narragansett Street in 1955 or 1956. Nana and Papa had three daughters, known affectionately to many on the island as the Dowdell sisters, who each had one child. The family loved summering on Martha's Vineyard and especially sitting on their front porch and waving to passersby, welcoming visitors and friends to sit and enjoy the wonderful breeze coming off of Nantucket Sound. In the early years, they often would rent bedrooms to help cover the cost of uh, the upkeep and maintenance of the home. And porch sitting is a long tradition in Martha's Vineyard. People would just pop up and visit and chat and sit for hours and it was just wonderful. And they do that today. Many neighbors would just stop by to get wisdom and advice from Nana Dowdell. Her love of gardening was known all over the island she even nursed a peach tree that uh, sits near the driveway back to health. The peaches were hard as rocks and she worked at it and worked at it. And this one summer, the tree was just bursting with juicy, wonderful peaches. It was amazing. She also knew a thing or two about natural medicine. She loved the parties on the vineyard and was always the first one in the house ready to go. The parties back then in the you know, 60s, 70s, and 80s were a big part of summer on the vineyard. And they were called five to sevens because that's when they were held from five o'clock to seven o'clock. And you could look at my aunt's calendars that would hang on the door in the kitchen and it would list all of the party invitations that they had from five to seven. They were yard parties and you knew to bring your own chair. And um, my cousins and their next door neighbor also gave a party every year until the early 2000s. One of the things that I loved most about Martha's Vineyard was going to the beach and that was grab a book, grab a towel, and run down to the beach, take a swim. And um, many of you may be familiar with uh, the beach called the Inkwell in Oak Bluffs. And there are many stories of how the beach came to be known as the Inkwell. Uh, some say it got its name during the Jim Crow era. There were two beaches in Oak Bluffs paid beach and town beach. Patrons, predominantly white, who paid access to the paid beach had lifeguards, dressing rooms, and toilet facilities. And town beach did not have those amenities and was frequented by 
the local residents and the African American community that was on the island and came to vacation at Martha's Vineyard. Over time, the Inkwell became known as the beach for Black folks. It still is for the most part, though I have seen some changes in the demographics over the years. Others believe the beach got its name because of the Harlem Renaissance writers and artists who summered in Oak Bluffs. One of the most well-known writers on the island was Dorothy West. And there even was a film by the name The Inkwell, though it wasn't filmed there. And then another beach uh, experience in Martha's Vineyard is to be part of the Polar Bears. It started out as an organization of friends who would take an early morning swim before they had to go to work. My Aunt Ruth taught a wa water aerobics class for many years, and I was a proud member before I realized how good my bed felt at that hour of the morning, then all bets were off. When I did participate, there couldn't have been more than maybe 15 and tops 30 people down at the beach at 6.30 in the morning. Mondays were when most people came, whether or not they swam because a potluck breakfast would be held at one of the polar bears homes. And that was a tradition. You would go after you finished your swim. Today, it is completely out of control, in my opinion. I have seen 70 to 100, maybe more than 100 people easily down at the beach in the mornings. Again, many are not going there for the swim. They're going there to socialize, to meet up with friends that they haven't seen in a long time. And uh, the potluck breakfast, well, right now it's on the beach. And the polar bears are certainly part of my vivid memory of time spent on the island. They even host uh, um, yoga classes on the beach in the morning now. And so much has changed over the years. But one thing is still there and Lauren mentioned it and it's the cottagers and my aunts were active members of the cottagers the historic nonprofit organization of African American women homeowners on Martha's Vineyard. It was founded in 1956 by a small group of women who owned homes in Oak Bluffs and their mission was to promote a sense of cultural pride by fundraising to support charitable, educational, and community service projects that help improve the quality of life in the Martha's Vineyard community. My cousins told me that it was really started because this group of women heard some white women sort of complaining and chastising uh, the Black community for not being active and supporting the community and organizations. Uh, the majority of early members came from Boston with others from New York and Illinois and Washington, D.C. Uh, as Lauren uh, mentioned, fundraisers included dinner dances, they had clam bakes and various cultural events. They would do house tours. And uh, by the early 60s, they held an annual fashion show, which was extremely popular. As the community on Martha's Vineyard, the Black community on Martha's Vineyard, continued to grow and expand, so did membership in the cottagers. And by the mid 60s, the group bought um, a town hall building in Oak Bluffs, as well as three additional lots. So they used the money that they raised to purchase a building and to purchase additional land. And once they became incorporated, they named the building Cottagers Corner. By the late 70s, they sold the other parcels of land and now there is a, they sold it back to the town and now there's a senior center located on that land. The cottagers give scholarships to graduating seniors from Martha's Vineyard High School. They donate money to the hospital 
and they also donate money to other organizations and nonprofits on the island. And their focus is again to enhance uh, the community of Martha's Vineyard. As the years uh, have passed, uh, the, there have been changes to the structure of the organization, but the charitable efforts continue on. And in 19, uh, 2006, I believe, Cottager's Corner was added as one of the sites on Martha's Vineyard African American Heritage Trail. Uh, recognizing the many contributions the organization's members made through the years to help the residents of Martha's Vineyard. It was such a peaceful time. You could get a reservation at a restaurant. You could walk on the street. There wasn't tons of traffic. And it was just going there was really sort of solace and, and just peace. And I know the movie Mr. Smith may have gone to Washington in 1939, but let me tell you, in 1994, Washington came to Martha's Vineyard in the name of Bill and Hillary Clinton. From that point on, there was traffic, and the island was forever changed. I know that the vineyard has been called the vacation spot for the black elite. And that may be true to some extent, especially now with the property costs on the island really exceeding the national average. Um, but it really became visible when the Clintons came. And then when the Obamas came, Politicians followed, holding fundraisers, academics hold talks, authors yeah. host reading, and readings. And it's just the character of the island is changing, that's what you're saying. Yes, it really is. The character of the island is changing. And in many ways, it feels as if Washington and many other metropolitan cities have been lifted up and just dropped in the middle of Oak Bluffs. The, the population is only 15,000 residents. And in the summer, it explodes to over 100,000. And it's almost similar to what we see in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. You know, population of roughly, what, 22, 25,000, and then it explodes in the summer and again in the fall. Um, even with the crowds, though, there is no place I would rather be during the summer vacation than sitting on the porch, walking down to the beach for a swim, and waking up each morning on Martha's Vineyard Island. Papa, Nana, and the sisters are gone now, as is my dad, but the children and grandchildren are here to carry on the legacy. I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And again, thank you so much for asking me to participate today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ms. Dodell. That was just so moving. I, I actually have to share my story. I am part of that, the problem since 94. <laughs> and as we have been traveling to the vineyard and my daughter who's now eight, when she was two, uh, we had traveled to the vineyard and she woke up overnight and finally she woke up and we were there and she said, oh, I'm in Martha's Vineyard. I've been waiting my whole life to be here. <laughs> so the power of that place is amazing. The draw of that place is amazing. Um, I've learned of the vineyard from my parents when we were young, we visited once or twice, but the draw of that place, it is a beautiful space, it's a beautiful place. And you know, how, as we began this conversation, on travel and travel equaling freedom. Martha's Vineyard has truly been one of those spaces of freedom for Black Americans for a very, very long time. And thank you, Ms. Dodell. Thank you, Ms. Van Allen. And thank you, Dr. Soren, for really helping to shape this conversation and give us another point of view. 
especially during Women's Month. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat room and we're going to open this um, conversation up to now include all of us. You also, um, we would like you to raise your hand if you have a question and I believe Jerry Ann will help me call on you if I miss you. But first of all, there are a couple of questions that have come in, um, mainly, mainly about Martha's Vineyard. Um, and one question is, how is the inflation, and in, in, um, Ms. Dowdell, you actually spoke of this, really affecting the Black population and home ownership on the vineyard? I'm curious to hear your view on this. Yeah. I try to buy a home. <laughs> One of the things that my father told me was that in the 50s, Martha's Vineyard was one of the first places that African Americans could really buy a second home or have a vacation home. Uh, financing would be a little, could be a little kludgy and depending upon where the home was located, there are some homeowners that actually purchased their properties through uh, codicils, through their lawyer, their white lawyers or accountants who facilitated the transaction. Uh, Narragansett Street, where my cousin's home is, it was from beginning to end, all black owned homes. And I will say that in the last 25 years, I have started to see a shift and more actively in the last decade, where now roughly 50% of the homes on Narragansett are owned by white families. The cost of living there is well above, especially I'll speak to Oak Bluffs, is well above the national average. Um, and the taxes are often prohibitive for families. The other trend that I have seen, and my, my aunts and I would talk about this, is the the inheritance and the passing down of the homes from generation to generation. And now they are bumping up against a generation that doesn't necessarily feel the historic attachment or have share the same love of Martha's Vineyard. And many of the children or grandchildren or great grandchildren who have inherited homes are selling because they want to travel. They want maybe they want a home in Myrtle Beach or, you know, to be someplace else. So there has been a very distinct shift. So mostly, I would say, born out of economics because it is prohibitive. You've got that salt sea air that bears down on those homes, and maintenance alone is very, very expensive. Expensive. Forget about you know, carrying a mortgage as well. Thank you, thank you. You know, something you said really struck a chord with me, particularly when you were speaking about the financing of a home. And Dr. Soren, you know, when you talked about home ownership and car ownership, all of a sudden I would say the light went off, right? Because we often talk about black people's relationship with their cars without really understanding that relationship with a car. So as we think about this space and place, can you talk a little bit more about the growing middle class and their travel, but also this car ownership or owning a piece of something when you couldn't necessarily often own the land underneath you. Do you know that stereotype about African Americans all owning Cadillacs? Yes. All own well, Cadillacs. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So the stereotype is that black people all buy Cadillacs and and actually black people buy Cadillacs 3%. Only 3% buy uh we're buying Cadillacs in this time period, but the reason that people bought high-end cars and cars that made some white people feel that they were buying cars above th their place in the world was because they had disposable income. They were had moved into the middle class. They had this disposable income and they couldn't get a mortgage. And that was because of collusion between realtors and banks. So even if your neighborhood was a good neighborhood, 
because it was perceived as a, it was a black neighborhood and all you had to have to get your labor, neighborhood redlined was one black family living there. And then it would be, it could be redlined. And so you wouldn't be able to purchase a house. Um, and the Green Book, if you, if you look at the Green Book, they were, they were cultivating the black middle class. The covers, there are these, you know, black uh, cup, there's a black couple that was his, his logo, a black couple with matched luggage. And in the background, there's a suburban house and a car. You know, he wanted the black middle class. It's also the time period when the very first corporate executives, all of whom are men, Joanne, so there weren't, there weren't any women, black executives at that time period, but their corporate executives are starting to travel and they don't wanna stay in dumpy hotels and eat at dumpy restaurants. They want to, and you know, eat out of, the, out of the back window of some restaurant. They wanna go to a nice restaurant and they wanna, they wanna go to a nice hotel and they can't go to the same hotels and the same restaurants that their white counterparts are going to. So the Green Book, um, and the fancy and the automobiles are are to serve those people as well. The, this is the first generation of black executives in corporate America. Wow, thank you. You Before know, women. <laughs> I, I know. you know, we um, New England blacks in philanthropy, we do a we spend a lot of our time uncovering this history, the history of us, so often is told from the lens of deficits rather than the assets that we brought, <coughs> not only brought, but still continue to bring. And Lauren, this you know brings me to you and thinking about even Martha's Vineyard today. Um, what is the population of Martha's Vineyard today? And also, I think there's another question here that wanted to um, not only understand whether do you, what is the population, but do you think that the Martha's Vineyard Black community is more visible than other places? Um, I think Joanne addressed um, the population. It's about 15, is that right, Joanne, to 20,000 in the winter. And then it goes up to over 100,000. And it's variable, obviously, because people are coming and going. Uh, you know, People are there for a week, a month, a summer. It's constantly changing. But that's a rough estimate. And in terms of um, visibility that I mentioned in my talk, that that's really my view of it because I do feel, you know, I'm over 50 years old now, and when I grew up, people didn't know about the vineyard. It was like a, I would say, even you know, in other places in Massachusetts, I'm going to the vineyard, and people would say, "Where is that?" They didn't really know the island, and they certainly didn't know that there was a black community there. And to Joanne's um, point, also in the 90s it really shifted when the Clintons started coming and it was like oh there's this island and it's so amazing and then really with the Obamas coming and it was like oh and there's black people there and it was like oh and there's this you know group of people who have been going it was like this you know people had no <laughs> idea and we had been there for over a hundred years even you know my family but there were people there of color who predated us. There were Cape Verdean whalers and fishermen, as somebody mentioned in the chat. There were domestics. There were people there for hundreds of years, but it's like it was just discovered in the last 10 to 20. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. And I'm going to follow up on that. Do you think that the opening of Shearer's Cottage was the beginning of Black vacation community on Martha's Vineyard, or were there other first? You know, I can speak to like what our experience is with our family. I do believe that there, and as I started in my talk, we're just one story of many stories. The Dowdells are another story and there are other families who have been going there. I can say that there probably were folks who predated us who were there on vacation. We were the first in um, who catered to that community, but you know, people came to the island before us and after us for many different reasons that had nothing to do with Shira Cottage. Um, but we certainly were a black owned business that was there and contributed to the community and continues to do so today. Thank you, thank you. You know, as I think about these first, um, I remember reading about sundown towns and actually in October, of last year, there was an article that AP put out about Vienna, Illinois, 
that is still kind of a sundown town. And I remember the chilling way in which that article opened um, where the guy very casually at a bar says, we don't have a race problem here. And he just kind of smirks. And then the article goes on to say, you know, how this is still a sundown town. And so um, Gretchen, as you know, as I was thinking about what you were saying, um, and, and even the insurrection or even my driving, I, my grandmother lives in Mississippi, we grew up in Ohio, you know, you're driving through all of these states and you're even in the 70s and 80s, you're rarely stopping, right? So how is this, what is the persistence of these sundown towns and, and, and why are they still existing? Because one of the things I, I want people to understand, that may have been then, but it's my understanding that they're still existing. Is that correct? One, one of my um, former students uh, is the director of a museum in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. And he called me this year and asked me if Manitowoc had been a sundown town because the mayor of Manitowoc was concerned that they have very few black people living within the borders of Manitowoc, Wisconsin. And somebody said, well, that's because we were a sundown town and the mayor couldn't believe it. So I did a little research for this student and former student and, and found out that Manitowoc, Wisconsin had been a sundown town. But what I discovered was that these are places that African-Americans never felt comfortable and don't feel comfortable now. Because Why would you? Why would you think, well, gee, there's a former sundown town. I think I'll buy property there. You know, you're not, why would you move in there? You wouldn't. So these towns are largely still white because African-Americans are uncomfortable and they feel these are unfriendly places, even though Manitowoc was concerned. They, you know, they wanted more black people to move in. And I said, well, why, you know, if, do you wanna be the first and only black person moving into Manitowoc or Darien, Connecticut or some of these other communities, not all of the communities had signs. So places like um, Palm Beach in Florida or Miami Beach didn't necessarily have signs, but you could be, if you, Miami Beach, for example, you could be arrested if you went onto Miami Beach. So everybody knew if you're black, you don't go to Miami Beach. You can go to Miami, but not Miami Beach. Um, and the same thing was true, I interviewed the man who was the driver for the Salzberger family, and they would go to Palm Beach in Florida every winter, but he wasn't allowed in Palm Beach. He had to stay in West Palm Beach because even, even as the driver of the family, you couldn't stay, they could, he couldn't stay at the house. He had to go to West Palm Beach. So there, were, there wasn't necessarily a town, a, a sign, but the police, you know, and this is the other issue about the police. The police were charged with preventing black people from going into these communities. Sets up that relationship that the police are anti-black again. You know, you, you bring, you have woven in so many different things, um, um, especially around this narrative of black and people say, well, I don't see black middle class. Well, why would you? Why would you, when your communities are unfriendly, why would you, when it could be dangerous? And so thank you so much for bringing that point up because it counters that narrative that we don't exist. And I, I just think we, we could talk about this all day, but there's so many questions about Martha's Vineyard yeah. that are in the chat room as well. Um, you know, Joanne, you spoke it's just so lovingly about the porch and sitting on the porch and just waving at people and um, people that you know and and having this, this tradition uh, of just watching. And so one question um, is, as you spoke about the porch and the Martha's Vineyard culture and the wider African-American culture, how did you, how did you see this developing? And as the, the demographics are changing, how is it lending its way into a legacy, so to speak? That's a very interesting question because I think 
um, the legacy of Martha's Vineyard and African Americans on the island will be uh, retained by events like this in the African American uh, Museum and their standing exhibit um, through oral histories because there is a shift and a change. I, I can't, I don't have a crystal ball. I can only see what has happened thus far as, as far as in Oak Bluffs where many African-Americans owned homes that that is starting to change. I did see a question about the demographics and um, Martha's Vineyard is 88% white, right? 3.7% black, and American Indian uh, just under half a percent. And that's um, two or more races, 4.8, almost 5%. So those are the demographics. I think that if you, and it would be interesting to see town by town and home demographics by home ownership, how that is shifting, but the legacy is going to have to be found in the books and in the stories. Um, I do think that there is more change coming to the island. The pandemic certainly held off um, a lot of people traveling unless they owned homes and were going there to just make sure that their homes, you know, how much maintenance need, how much work needed to be done. Um, but not the vacationers like, like we know. I did not go right. last year, so. Right. Can I, can I add a point about the Democrat? Sure. Please. I just, I think it's important to note, thank you, Joanne, for sharing those statistics that um, my guess, my speculation is that those, those percentages are for year round residents. It is 3.7 to four full time year round black residents. Right, yeah. and I think it's important to note that there are lots of people who own property there but it's their second home. So Correct. they may be African American but they're not gonna be counted in those statistics. Exactly. Um, so I think that's important to note one and then number two, that there are a lot of people who come every year for a month or two and don't own, but they're there and they're part of the community. So I just wanted to make that observation. And, and to your point, Lauren, it's not my understanding that about 4,500 black people are there year round and it swells to over 20,000 for that tiny island of black people, of us, that sojourn to Martha's Vineyard because the power of that place. But you know, one of the things that both of you brought up, and there's a question in the chat room about this. Um, I read this amazing book, The Emperor of Ocean Park by Stephen Carter. And you know, it's the fictional account of these people coming together to have real influence um, in the civil rights movement. And it's there's a question in here, and it made me think of this. You know, with so many people going to the island every year, what what do you think the influence of the people of Martha's Vineyard was in the civil rights movement? Um, and how do you think? Um, what place or what role did it play, especially having um, many of the names that you mentioned, Lauren, coming to the island? I can't help but think it was a little bit like the Emperor of Ocean Park. Um, can you share your thoughts, Lauren or, well, Lauren, um, Joanne or Gretchen or all? Um, so certainly the island was a destination for a lot of people who were active in the civil rights movement. Um, you know, a lot of people who were active in the civil rights movement were college students, politicians, entertainers, and there definitely are people who either traveled and vacationed on the island, you know, Bluffs in particular, or owned homes there and got together. We know Martin Luther King was there and stayed not far from where Joanne's family's houses at the Overton house um, in Oak Bluffs. Um, so, um, I, 
you know, I'm sure there was a lot of activity. I, I don't know if you'd like to add to that, Joanne, around civil rights. You know, thought leaders, um, as I'm going to say, as it is now, yeah. where you get the academics and the thought leaders, you get clergy, you get uh, civic leaders and community leaders that travel there and they would find their place and space on island to have conversations and engage in, um, uh, you know, I want to say not only philosophical discussion and intellectual thought, but action plan. What what's next when we leave? You still see some of that today with some of the programming that is held on the island and uh, the groups that now will come and rent homes and you know it'll be like a retreat uh, where they do planning and um, uh, on social justice issues and around how they're going to raise money to be able to get their messages out. So that's that still takes place today. You know, and I would add, so I would say something a little different. Um, my research indicates that a lot of what Joanne was saying, the people who were involved in intense civil rights work all the time, like like Martin Luther King, um, wanted to get away from it every now and then. Mm -hmm. You know, they just be away and be in a place where you didn't have to feel that you were going to have a bomb thrown that thrown at your house mm -hmm. or um, that you were going to have some violent, horrible thing happen to your children. And I think for, um, I, I know this was true at, at Rock Rest um, and other resorts that people psychologically wanted the psychological respite from the racism in the greater society. And that that's what these resorts um, and places that were in different parts of the country, including Martha's Vineyard provided, it was this respite from this kind of constant barrage of hateful behavior that they experienced day to day. And when you think about the experiences of the first black executives, the first uh, you know, black teachers at a university, all white university, the first you know, um, I think scholars are very critical of the black middle class, which infuriates me because they say, oh, you know, the black middle class didn't ignored their poor, poor blacks. And no, that wasn't the case at all. They were constantly doing things to support poor blacks. It just the white folks weren't aware of it, but they were also taking the brunt of being the first. In, in schools and universities, in corporations and businesses. And that placed a huge psychological toll, took a huge so psychological toll on these folks so that they just wanna go somewhere and be quiet and get away from the racism. It still does take a toll on us. <laughs> right. That much hasn't changed that much. Well, yeah, I didn't mean it was over. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, you, I, I, that is so important to mention. We are human. We are people. We, we, we have a psyche as well. And I think it is almost like we're seeing some time to be superhuman, that we have to do it all, all the time. And I'm so happy that you mentioned that. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention my mentor, Dr. Ogletree and his lectures. Yes. And, you know, I, I'm... It, like he, he, he just did so much for so many of us and particularly on the island and he would bring his talks and he was almost like his own like little movement as well. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention how much that he actually was a part of the island and part of those conversations as well and needed a space to get away and be quiet and think and listen and recharge. And we do need that opportunity to recharge. One of the questions- And if I could just end to add, 
um, Vernon Jordan, who recently, Vernon Jordan, passed, yes. recently passed away. Yes. Um, he, he has been known to say that he wouldn't do fundraisers. He liked to stay at the farm and go to church and read a book every now and again, but he and his wife yes. um, would stay for the summers and um, he liked just getting away. He will be sorely missed. He will be sorely missed. Thank you so much for mentioning him and, you know, missed all the way around, even mm -hmm. on the island in particular, because he supported so many of us. Um, you know, I want to go back a little bit in history. And one of the questions that's in the chat room that the Black community um, in Oak Bluffs began long time ago. It even was around during the whaling days when Black uh, sailors lived there and that Quakers had an influence on the island that may have made it a little bit easier and accessible um, to free Blacks and some abolitionists. And I want to make sure that we know that abolitionists were Black too. Um, uh, are, are these things true or do you think that beginning helped this place to be more, I don't know how to say it, Martha's Vineyard, like more so than even a Nantucket, um, that, that space and place that you can be like totally yourself on land. How, what do you think about that accessibility? I would like to speak to that. I mean, I think that there are a lot of different variables that contribute. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very difficult to sort of pinpoint this is the reason for yeah. why the community involved. But I do want to state that the origins of uh, stories of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket are very similar, nearly identical, where you also had Cape Verdean whalers and fishermen of color on Nantucket and on Martha's Vineyard. The first African meeting house in the country is on Nantucket. There were domestic servants on Nantucket, on Martha's Vineyard, enslaved people, almost identical. But over time, the community of color on the vineyard, there was more of a tolerance for that community from uh, other residents of the island that, that didn't necessarily um, exclude or push, the, and not to say that there wasn't racism because there certainly was, but the communities that existed on Nantucket pretty much don't exist anymore for the most part, but the community on the vineyard continued to grow and thrive. And there are many, many different reasons for why that is, but a lot of it is because many of the, the, if you would call, leading families in the island were tolerant of people who were different. Thank you, thank you, Lauren. And thank you for bringing in that piece on Nantucket because I think there's often, you know, not that conversation that talks about both, even though there's a historic house right there on Nantucket, right? And I'm curious, um, Joanne and Gretchen, your thoughts um, based um, similar to what Lauren laid out on Na the growth of Martha's Vineyard and especially with Nantucket being its neighbor right there. I'm not that familiar with the history of Nantucket. Um, I can only speak to and, and, and really reinforce what Lauren said about uh, Martha's Vineyard being more welcoming or accepting of people of color. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that was the impetus for a lot of the growth of the African-American community on the island. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Word, word gets around. It, and it did. <laughs> word gets around. Mm -hmm. The only thing I have to add is that I, I do know that Nantucket is beginning to talk about the history of Blacks um, mm. in whaling. Mm. Um, and uh, the only reason I know that is that one of my students did a Nantucket internship last mm. summer and, and a remote internship. And then he talked about mm -hmm. the importance of, of the Black whalers and the uh, more egalitarian view when they were out at sea. You know, because if you had to depend on a, a black Cape Verdean whaler, um, you know, you you got to be friends, you got to be colleagues, you they work together. Um, so the museum is starting to talk about it. And but you're right, I think I think Lauren is absolutely right about why it developed on Martha's Vineyard and not on Nantucket. 
Yeah, because the histories, if you went back to the 16, 17, 1800s, was, was nearly identical. Nantucket's a little further out, a little less accessible, but not in any sort of meaningful way, especially how tra people traveled to those islands in those days. And I just want to mention that someone put in the chat um, a book that was written by Islander or a vineyard vineyarder, one of our own, um, Skip Finley, and it's about Black whaling captains of color, and it's um, uh, yeah. a you know, a good resource if you want to check it out. Thank you. And think I about, think about Hilton Head. Yes. Hilton Head was one of the, that was a totally slave yes. owned island that is now completely devoid of any black people. <laughs> but Defusky Island, which is, That's, you can see, yeah. Defusky Island is the last Un, I, I don't know what, unimproved, you know, it's the last wild island and there's still a black community there, but only because people, a lot of people have worked really hard to protect that community. And I, I when I look around the country at the black resorts, mm -hmm. Oak Bluffs is one of the only ones left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The others are gone. American mm -hmm. Beach, Val Verde, you know, they, they're, they're gone. But as something about that power of place, um, and I have to go back to that title, um, you know, having gone to, we, we vacationed many times in Hilton Head, it is not the same. It is, they, they, the, the, it is something about almost like Green Book like, or Sundown Town like, you almost don't feel safe or safe in that place. And I know that we have our hand up for one thing, but I do wanna go back to this safe in place because there's one question about the curious, um, curious about people's thoughts about the impact of having a safe place to go and be rather than just simple leisure travel, which really points to kind of that Hilton head feel versus what you feel at Martha's Vineyard. Um, to some degree. Would anyone like to talk a little bit more about that? And then I'm going to go to the hand that is raised. I think um, what people perceived as safe was, is complicated. I mean, I, there are a lot of people that would never leave their communities. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't leave home they, because, they, because they had to travel through space, places that are not safe. Mm -hmm. And in interviewing people, you know, people said, my family never, we never went anywhere or we never went more than 20 miles from home because they didn't want to leave their community um, because, because it wasn't self safe. Other people, the whole idea of travel, um, the, the traveling part was the scary part. Right. Once you got to your destination, that was the safe part. And it was, it could be going home. Those of us who are part of the great migration my parents were part of the Great Migration. Mm -hmm. The home for my mother was North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Just as you, you said, your family came from Mississippi. Um, right. So home, once you got, got to home, wherever home was, that was a, a safe place. But if you could afford it and, and, and you weren't from the South, you weren't part of that Great Migration, you might find that safe place in a resort community like Oak Bluffs, right. or the city or... American Beach. You know, what you brought up for me as I looked at that question, it's not as simple as just leisure and travel when you're Black. No. It is just not that simple. And it wasn't that simple in Hilton Head in 2012 or 13. Um, and I think as someone that was traveling, I'm not interested in going someplace just because it's lovely to feel that I'm not supposed to be there. And there is something about Martha's Vineyard that says you're home, you belong here. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another piece that underlines that safetyness and that safe place. It's not just simple leisure. It's not just simple travel because I am black in America. Um, and with that, I'm gonna go to the raised hand um, and I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Um, um, which is one of our co-hosts. It's only me, but I had to jump in to ask. Um, there was so much that came up and this may be multiple questions. Um, uh, when you were talking about Hilton Head, I was thinking that, you know, the, the disappearing of this, this black community that was on this land that was originally 
not thought to be important and then it was deemed important after. I was thinking of Beacon Hill. Beacon was not, Beacon Hill was an enclave for African Americans. And then all of a sudden it became um, desirable and all these laws were put in place to then oust the, the owners of those properties. And I'm wondering if, if because on Martha's Vineyards there's this critical mass and um, that the, you know, they own the, their own, their property, and it's been carried on through generations that you've been able to keep that culture there. Whereas other communities, you know, um, because of the laws that are put in place and because they don't have critical mass, they're not able to keep that place. So that's one question. And I wanna talk about this, this, th this tension between, um, between race and class. I mean, you were, we're still talking about people on, on uh, Martha's Vineyard, people that have a, a measure of wealth, but we're still looking at the, the racialized tensions that we go through in, in traveling, in living your life. And what is that like navigating those spaces where race seems to outweigh class or should we even not worry about class at all? So this, there's a lot to unpack there and, and what you just said. And I'm gonna try to maybe parse out a little bit and be brief so I can allow my co-panelists to, to, to weigh in as well. But I would say, yeah, Beacon Hill, my great, great, grand, not my great, great grandfather, not a sheriff, but on another side of the family lived in Beacon Hill when that was a black area. And it was a black area because that was not a desirable part of town because there were um, stables in what is now uh, Boston Common. So there were horses and it was smelled bad and it wasn't, it wasn't the nice part of town. That changed. Fortunately, the Museum of African American History in Boston is still located there to remind people that we were there and had a presence there. So that's that part. And then in terms of um, the elite, if you will, being on Martha's Vineyard, you know, there's a there's a vision that people have of, of what the island is and who's there that I think is often inaccurate, right? People forget that while it is a vacation destination for a lot of people, and there is certainly a lot of wealth there, there are also a lot of people there who are fishermen, um, who are supporting the tourist industry there, who work in restaurants, who, you know, and they're people of color, they're white people, they're Cape Verdean, they're indigenous. We all coexist on that place. It's not just, you know, sort of, one aspect of um, society that's on on this. Do you island. think that will continue as it becomes more um, more elite, more rarefied? You know, I, as I, the island. I, I think it, it it has to. I mean, I think in order for the elites, if you will, to be there, there has to be the supports to you know um, the hotels. People have to work in the hotels. People have to work in the restaurants. I mean, there's support industries that. Uh, are there. And I think there always has been. And I think when you remove the summer residents who were there, most people there are not wealthy people. Mm, the people right. who live there, it's, it's not, um, you know, an exclusively rich enclave. It, it's, it's a little bit of a perception. I was just thinking about what Joanne was saying about the, the cost of property and the so, taxes, the, the, the increasing tax that's for a lot of people to sell over the years. And because property values are so high, people say, I can get all this money and do something else. And there are a lot of people, to Joanne's point, that are selling. But there are also a lot of people who are buying in. And right. I just think it's, it's just cycling. You know, there are people who were there in the 40s and 50s. Their families aren't there anymore. But there are new people and new families coming in and buying all the time. It just kind of... The other thing that has long been a tradition as far as the... Um, uh, I'll say the summer employment on Martha's Vineyard is to bring large groups of foreign students either from, I know that one year they were from Croatia, one year they were from um, uh, Nigeria, one year, you know, from all around the world, but Trump's visa uh, policies that were enacted so severely restricted those programs to continue. So the bars and restaurants and hotels that relied on that program to feed their summer employment, they had, they had difficulties. 
Um, so there are, to Lauren's po point, you have to have the support system for those people who are there vacationing or who are summer homeowners or seasonal renters. And without that, then that, that economic base that's there tends to weaken. But right now, um, you know, I've been watching, I think the pandemic has led to more home sales, which means opportunity for people to buy. So I don't, I don't think it goes away. I don't think it goes away. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think that I discovered, particularly during my years in New York, you have a lot of black professional class that, or mm -hmm. professionals that constantly come to the island, whether you're from New York, whether you're from Chicago, whether you're from the West, that you're coming to the island, you're hearing about it from your friends, you're hearing about it from your other groups. And it actually lends itself to the question that is in the chat room. It says, what about the Obama's vacations to the island? How did that highlight the importance of this place in black culture? Um, because I do hear more black people talking about the vineyard um, more so than when I was young. So how do you think, you know, the Obamas being there, how did that impact, you know, Martha's Vineyard as a place and important in black culture? Well, for one thing, it made it cool. Uh, <laughs> cooler than it even was when the Clintons came because when the Clintons came, that started the coolness of Martha's Vineyard and people who knew, who knew they started to know where Martha's Vineyard was before people would say, I'm going to the Cape because people know the Cape. Uh, um, but I think that the Obamas actually purchasing property there, not so much that they even came on the summers that they did, but the fact that they made a commitment to the community by purchasing property, uh, the pandemic kind of broke up what we might see happen as a result of that. And maybe we see that this summer and next, what, how, that, how they're being their trends for visitors and um, the, the African-American community really standing up and showing up. Lauren, what's your take on that? Um, my take on it is, it started with the Clintons, but particularly when the Obamas started coming on vacation and when he was elected president, I feel like that was when that sort of cloak of invisibility <laughs> kind of lifted. And, you know, I had people um, in my other life off island, you know, very curious you know, my colleagues at work about, oh, there's this black community. And it's like, you know me, you know, I've been there. And all of a sudden, but all of a sudden it like clicked and they started paying attention and it became interesting. And there were stories in, in media and on CNN and in the news and there were reporters there and it just kind of blew up, I think, um, in a new way when, you know, the Obamas were coming and elected he was elected president and they were spending a lot of time there in August. Um, you know, it right. right, thank you for sharing that. Um, Gretchen, I didn't know if you had more to share around what, you know, as you no, think. I, I was just thinking something funny. I would much rather go there than Mar-a-Lago. I'll tell you, that was <laughs> that was what came to mind immediately. <laughs> well, well, I saw something <laughs> on your face. It was like a little smirk and I was like, oh. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I thought, well, I'd much rather go there than, than Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> I know. Um, and, and someone mentioned it, Spike Lee also. Yes, yeah, Spike is there. Everyone's there. You know, yeah, Gates is riding his bike, little tricycle. I don't say, don't tell him I said bike. tricycle, but you know Rides what I'm saying. Oh, one of those tricycles? Oh, that's funny. Oh, it is, and it's huge. It's huge. You know, um, I'm sorry, Lauren, you were gonna say? Well, I was just gonna say, Spike has been going there for a long time. He predated the Obamas and owned a house there. And there were other people, whether they were households. That's right. You know, Valerie Jarrett grew up spending her summers there. There were lots of people who were there, right? They were there, but it was under the radar. It was like, you know, 
you could be somewhere and you'd see somebody famous or a politician or an actor and they maybe owned a home there, but it was very like, people didn't know. If you weren't on the island, like you didn't know. But like now it's like, oh, you know, everybody knows. I don't, I don't know, am I capture? am I articulating? No, it's true. And the media is there and it's just, it's a completely different level. It's not the serene oh, sort of quiet. state yeah. type of vacation spot. It is very busy and crowded and social. And it was always social, but very, the, the, it has all been elevated as a result of yeah. But Gretchen, we will still welcome you. Just let us know when you're coming. <laughs> we are waiting for you, Gretchen. Just uh, let us know when you're coming. And I'm, I'm going to do that. <laughs> on Joanne's porch and wave. And then say, come on in. You know, it, you know uh, the, the National African American Museum, um, what is it called? The National Museum of African American History and Culture has created a symbolic porch. Mm -hmm. The entry level uh, of the museum it's, it's not a literal porch, but it is a, they call it the porch. And it's an area where you can get out of the heat from the DC uh, summer. And they created it because they felt architecturally that it was very important to African-American, um, the African-American community. So they have, that museum has a porch. What a wonderful place to end at the porch. Because that yeah. porch is that space of welcoming, that porch is that place of power of our culture where we tell our stories. You know, I have to say, this has been a great way to spend my Sunday. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Soren, for setting that right. context and not. Bethiah, Bethi sorry, I hate to interrupt you before you close this out, but um, someone who just pointed out that Nancy Rockwell had been waving her hand for a while. Oh, oh <laughs> sorry. She I didn't know. know how to put the, maybe she didn't know how to put the thing no, on. No, I don't see the hand up. Nancy, all right, I'm so sorry. I didn't. Oh, that's all right. I, it was a wonderful place to end on the porch, but since you've recognized me, I thank you. And <clears throat> I wanted to say that my, uh, I read some that a, a real estate LLC, some big company went into Nantucket and bought up whole sections of working class homes and, and homes of people of color and bought them up and people, many people were glad for the money, but they didn't realize that the whole community was being uh, bought up and they flipped it. And then Nantucket had a problem with no place to live for working class folks that they needed on the island. I think Martha's Vineyard took that to heart and has tried to prevent that. And I think that the development of a really upper class black residents like the Obamas and whoever else is there, they will be part of those conversations about, and they will know and they will flag these attempts to try to, so I, I think they could offer a protection really for the community that you have so beautifully described today um, on Martha's Vineyard. I hope they do, but the, they could offer real help in preserving what you've got, so. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you. And thank you for that thought. You know, it's, it's really a preservation of what we have. This is our history, our American history, our collective American porch. And I cannot um, thank you enough for not only sharing that preservation or thinking about the legacy, but also we have to think about from where we came. So Dr. Soren, thank you so much for setting that context, for helping us understand. Um, and I particularly understood mobility and travel equaling freedom and people having that freedom to go, but also that danger that lies in the middle. And when we get to that destination, a place like Martha's Vineyard, thank you so much, Lauren, for sharing the story of your family. Thank you, and thank you, family, for being out there. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all you've done to preserve our history. And Joanne, thank you so much for just bringing us to the porch. 
I just, I, you know, I think this was a great conversation and a conversation to help us understand the dynamics, the wonderful complex dynamic of black American history and how we have contributed to American history. And so I wanna say thank you for the power of this place for this discussion as I turn the program back over to Jerry Ann and back over to um, um, Gina, I think, oh, I'm sorry, Carolyn Saunders, um, who will close us out. Thank you so, so very much. And I look forward to chatting with you in the future. And thank you all so much. And Bethia, I have to say, everything I thought to say you've already said, with one exception, you started this program by saying you were so thrilled, so to speak, to be uh, here with three distinguished women. And I, I have to add and make that four. You did such a masterful job of moderating and facilitating. So thank you also. And, and thank all of you for, you know, just bringing the power, the power of the place to us. And I really felt as though we were porch sitting and um, I can't wait to get back to Oak Bluff. So thank you for doing that for us. Um, and what I wanted to do today or what I've been asked to do is just say thank you to the audience. Thank you to all of you who choose to spend some of your Sunday afternoons with us. Without the audience, we would have nothing. So we really appreciate that. I also want to thank all the volunteers from the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire. Everything you contribute adds and builds to this wonderful organization. So thank you for all that you do and all that you'll continue to do. I also have to thank our sponsor in particular, uh, New Hampshire Humanities, without whom this program would not be possible. So thank you. And then it's also been mentioned, but it must be mentioned again, without our fearless leader, without our executive director, Jerry Ann Bogus, none of this would be. So Jerry Ann, thank you for all you do, all the creativity you bring to the programs. And thank you for all of you participating. Um, this was the fifth in our series, uh, in our Tea Talk series. It's coming to an end so quickly. So next week, March 14th, not March 7th, we'll have our final tea talk of the 2021 season on shaky ground, students of color in predominantly white institutions. So we hope you'll join us there. In the meanwhile, we've got some suggested readings for you. We also hope that you'll follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and also YouTube. So thank you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week.